Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Poetry Square for our month of July. And uh, we have a great evening for you tonight, as we do every month. Um, we have our three poets. We have two from the East Coast. And we have uh, my husband, Roger, filling in for Adrian Toomes, who could not be with us tonight from, from Philadelphia. Um, she uh, has had a um, emergency and couldn't be here tonight. So anyway, um, I'd like to thank uh, Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture. I'm their uh, poet in residence and welcome to Poetry Square. And I'll start us off with uh, some poetry of my own and uh, hope you enjoy. This is called Bear. Don't turn on the air conditioner. You'll wake the polar bear. He doesn't know it's 100 degrees because you only dreamed him. The electric meter spins around like rapid heartbeats. And when the air conditioner is on, brain cells in my cranium spoon into jello when it's off. It's cool morning, 70 degrees, 6 a.m. I water the vegetables and fruit. Succulents and cacti love this heat. Lush red at their tips, flowers like flutes from fat cactus that just last one day, then weep, fold inward, see you next year. Petunias, a riot of color in heat, dripping down pots. Roses explode their short lives, drop velvet skirts of color. The bear still sleeps in the corner. If we stay still, he won't see us. So we dance in our minds, recite poetry in text to one another. We eat our meals outside so he won't awaken walk on eggshells and hairballs, our feet burn on hot pavement. We watch TV through the neighbor's window, allow the bear to sleep soundly. We enter our home later, make love in the bathtub, put a metronome in the pantry so he'll think we're behind that door. We may have to eventually climb into the chest freezer that will surely fool the bear, show the world we won and didn't turn on the air conditioner. I'm not sure where everyone is, but here in Yuba Sutter, it's been in the upper 90s all week. And tomorrow it'll start going back to 105 and so on. We uh, have long, hot summers. Um, this is called Morning Enters Windows. Morning enters windows with probing rays of light, plants upturn to catch their kiss before darkness. The angle of sunlight reaches between green fronds, lapping leaves like waves creating sea glass. Fire spills onto greenery, Prometheus at the garden gate. New growth reaches for his touch before he leaves for the night. And uh, talking about hot weather, this would be a, a great thing for now. This is called civility. The way Meyer lemons slice right from the tree, crisp, fresh citrus adds yellow to clarity of gin in my on the rocks glass. Primary color in still life, clear glass, distilled juniper berries, cut lemon. Bold statement for an understated day. Watching an old Gary Cooper movie, pondering the ice in my drink. No formal cocktail hour, no dressing for dinner here. Another pours just as smoothly. Bubbles rise from the tonic. Miles Davis blows over 100 degree heat. Ice clinking, 
sinking to bottom of glass. Where my lips reach the last cube, crack it with my teeth as it surrenders down my throat. I celebrate my dependence on this little bit of civility. And uh, this is called abundance. The world expands with knowledge, travel, relocation, read, build. Beware too many questions with yes or no answers. Real life has numerous choices. Geography is destiny, not biology, as Freud said. Hell is being yourself in the wrong place with the wrong people. For some, the key is in the lock, but the hand doesn't turn it. Others will push all day against a door labeled pull, ending up with a cracked door and a glimpse of what they still won't enter. Pious and born again, repent and all is well, forgiven. Create good works and service to humanity is stead. Art is prayer, pray often. Be wary what you wish for. Dorian Gray's portrait in my attic is slender and redheaded, but entirely uncomfortable in her own pallid skin. Her youth and attraction, but practice knows pleasure. I am ample confident in my words, tanned from toil in the outdoors. I offer you a taste of mature fruit beneath vines of sweet honeysuckle. Savor slowly, for it is ripe at the peak of season, and I have much experience of abundance in the garden. And, uh, this is, uh, we are in a drought here in California and uh, it's getting worse. You know, there are fires, uh, none directly near us, but uh, this is called Shades of Summer. Drought this year, Western heat breaking records, desiccated skeletal summer, dry docking outdoor plans. Gardens grown under pressure to produce more with less. Threats of mandated water restriction looms. Roses come and go in a day like daylilies, only not so. Memories of summer showers back east. Many weekends soggy for plans. Thunderstorms that conjured the dead shook with fire and brimstone that made the innocent repent. Cicadas orchestrated humidity as it rose higher despite the break of sudden storm. I love watching all the flavors of rain. Summer there melted like popsicles. Here it crackles like fire. This is called Then and Now. If I had never left Rochester 22 years ago, I would never have known San Diego, raised my children away from family ghosts. If I had bought an old Victorian house, I would have cluttered it up with the past instead of the rural present or the skylit future. If my ex-husband had never abandoned me, I wouldn't have known a good solid man who took all of us in without hesitation. If I had, had been a stay-at-home mom, I wouldn't have cherished my boys as much, each moment a gift, not a chore. If we would have stayed in our Tehachapi cabin, I would never have known the loneliness of the gray landscape of central Nevada. If I could have kept my Great Dane, I wouldn't have known the entire spectrum of how cruel a world can be. 
If I had moved back to Rochester after the divorce, I would never have met my now husband's crooked smile and generous true love. If I had not taken another chance at trust, I would never have traveled. Tra <laughs> sorry, I would never have seen Europe and Australia without the heavy baggage of my past. And if I had hugged what seemed a soft polar bear, I would never have still been alive to enjoy the real world apart from fantasy. And uh, this is another poem for this kind of weather. And uh, it's a brand new poem actually birthed yesterday. The swimming pool in full sun, morning best after garden work, long strokes from one end to the other, birds on branches greet strengthening sun as I pull and kick, twist and stretch, glide through aquamarine Xanadu. I swim several times a day, laps for exercise, back float and butterfly to watch the Larimar sky. Relax, dogs asleep bake in squares of sun, unnoticed squirrels skitter along fence top. We are all too mellow to care, water and sun and breath, all we really need in summer to shine. And this one doesn't have a title. The hollyhocks have sheltered me from the brevity of childhood. My hands grew dirty with age. My legs grew strong with spite. I am the knot in the pine, the owl in the oak. You may have seen Coyote, the trickster in the woods. I have lived there too with them, nurtured my cubs, showed them cunning ways to survive, to make their way amid humans without notice until a veil of darkness brings out the keen survivor in us all. And uh, I have two poems left. And this one, um, I also am a mosaic artist and a collage artist. And this one is called Mosaics. I collect glass, old plates, odd earrings, all imperfect pieces to form a whole. The ceramic mime, gate silica, clay snake, vintage marbles. I hunt far and wide. Yesterday, a saucer broke onto the floor. Mosaic, I shouted. Early mornings in the shade of liquid amber, I fit and cut and break and glue. A different act than writing. No thinking, just pattern, instinct, and color. I leave them to bake in sun perfect for the task. I go inside, begin thinking under shower, dress and sprawl in chaise in living room, move pen across paper, let words spill out in poetic attempts to make sense of the world in language, having used the sharpest edges in piles of broken glass. And I'm gonna end with this poem. And uh, it's uh, for a friend of mine that I found out uh, is almost past today. The goal in life is to be someone to somebody, to be ready to explore the road ahead, even if afraid, even if you think it's stacked against you if you've lost before, 
if you had no seat at the table, if no voice would come out. Take that journey, that risk. You needn't leap out of a plane to land on your feet, get your bearings, squeeze it all in, for we never know when our time will be up. And to all those excuses, I've no time, it's too hot, too cold, I'm tired, I just want to sleep. You'll sleep forever one day when your lips will no longer impart reasons for why you won't go out, won't have friends in your messy house, how your body is too old, too heavy, too scrawny or weak. Just do it. Do it as good as you can. Make them miss your sass, your zest for trying the new, even in your average clothes, your old model car, the room you occupy but isn't your shell to hide in. You never know when your heart will cease. Just do it, do it well, and catch your sleep later. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Don Lease, a poet from um, Pen uh, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Diane, for inviting me. Thank you to the um, Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture and to Shantae and to Abby. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm, the first poem I'm going to read is from my first chapbook, I Know When to Keep Quiet, um, and it is called Ashes. My father was a volcano spewing lava that night. Tables became timber, curtains fell, walls crumbled. My mother was a hummingbird darting between him and us, wings humming false promises that evaporated in the heat. In the next room, my, mother, my sister and I shared a double bed like we had shared our mother's womb, a tangle of legs and arms, her thumping heart close to mine. A sliver of light sliced our room as mother appeared, then disappeared again. I folded my arms and blinked like I dream of Jeannie. Nothing. In the morning, we tiptoed over rocky landscape. We washed our hands in ashes. We waited. And um, just this week, I had the opportunity to see both of my sons, my adult sons, um, for the first time, my younger son for the first time since December of 2019 because of the pandemic. So they've been on my mind a lot. I often write about them, uh, much to their dismay. So I decided to read a poem from my full length collection, Take Something When You Go, um, called City Dwellers, which is about both of my sons when they had gone um, away, they were away at college in New York City. It's called City Dwellers. I raised city dwellers deep in suburban trenches, bordering farmland and forest, with a state park as a playground. Wine of Saturday morning lawnmowers, sting of weed killer, houses buttoned up with central air, block parties, and flashlight tag. I said no to walking to friends' houses on county roads, no sidewalks, a berm of, dirt, of rocky ditches. We spent their childhood in an SUV, to and from school, piano, soccer, golf lessons. After bedtime stories, I whispered prayers. Please find your way. I packed lunch notes. You can go far. Now they travel I-80 through the Delaware Water Gap, its mountains russet across my home state, through the Lincoln Tunnel to Washington Square Park, over the GW, north on the Henry Hudson to a Hughes Street off-campus apartment. Subway maps are decoded, routes memorized for the NQR, the 123 Metro North. They wander the streets from Alphabet City to the Upper West Side and see bands I never heard of at Webster Hall in Terminal 5. They text and call home. There's no reason to return, I say. You found your way, I'll find mine. I'm also going to read another poem from this collection um, that's about Seaside Heights, New Jersey. I am, um, I was born in New Jersey, it's, it's my home state and um, the Jersey Shore is a special place to me. And um, this is about Seaside Heights 2011, just about a year before Hurricane Sandy came through and destroyed part of the boardwalk. After prayer and incense at mass, a police escorted procession and an Irish family goodbye, the Atlantic pulls you east. 
You walk the weathered boards of your childhood, past lucky Leos, thud of ski ball, ski ball and jangle of arcade music, a portal to Saturdays counting tickets and picking prizes. The air is alive with Italian sausage sizzle, pizza grease, the tang of vinegar fries. In the Berkeley sweet shop, you escape the November wind to warm your nose and fingers. Buy creamy chocolate fudge that will be gone by the time you cross the Pennsylvania border. The late afternoon draws geometric shadows on the wide swath of beach, polka dotted with people. You meet your cousin at the tip of a triangle, walk dry sand to wet, and your words tangle with the wind, then dissolve in the spray. That day, your grandmother is the Atlantic, a blue horizon, an infinite wave, white-capped water that spirals and folds and ebbs, a circular tide carrying all memory of the past, all the secrets of your future. Um, Shantae, maybe you can put a picture up of the next book, please. Um, this is my latest collection. Um, it's called A Person Worth Knowing, and it is um, it was just released by Foothills Publishing, a wonderful um, publisher in upstate New York. And I love this book because it's hand stitched and it just has a lot of meaning to me that Foothills published it. So I'm going to read two poems from this. And this first one is called Day Job. Um, all of these poems are about people, some that I know, some that I don't. Um, and this is somebody that I was passing by on a street and it, he just caught my attention. So I decided to, um, to write a poem about him. It's called Day Job. Hanging on the back of a tire truck, he exhales streams of vapor at 7 a.m. Still wearing yesterday's skinny jeans and red Chuck Taylors, the required fluorescent vest pulled over his hoodie. He rubs the night from his eyes and pulls gloves from his back pocket. He plays nights into these mornings at all the local places, floors sticky with beer, tables crowded with college kids spending their minimum wages on dollar drafts and jukebox memories filled with wages carrying long hours of trays, looking for tips big enough to take them away from here, someday. He plays his guitar electric and blue until last call, walks the blocks he works in daylight home to a garage apartment to catch three hours of sleep. Jumping down, he takes time walking to the curb, swings overstuffed green bags into the belly of the truck, pushes, and pull, pushes a button to crush and compact. He repletes block after block. At the end of the run, he climbs back onto his ride, spits last night's stale taste into the gutter. He tightens his grip when the truck lumbers around a corner, its pipes coughing black smoke, smoke motor whining against the frosty morning. This, this next poem is a found poem. It takes parts of or complete titles of various songs um, from groups like U2 and Genesis and Van Morrison. And it is called Gypsy Lee. The DJ's voice was made for the midnight shift, free flowing water with an occasional white rapid. He's just old enough to remember how to spin vinyl, how building a playlist is an art form, how the hiss of the needle can heal almost any wound. Nights undulate at his matchmaking, 70s funk hustles with 80s pop, moonwalks into crowd surfing with 90s grunge. They make beautiful children. There's no room for ordinary love, but in your eyes, November rain drenches him. He lets the flood disco. You're already gone, running and running into the mystic, where you'll wait for the boys of summer to take you to the church of your childhood, your very own home by the sea. Stay with the DJ until the end, and he'll prove you get what you give to the spinning. It's the denouement of night now, and as the sky somersaults, you're alone in these dreams, where he's nicknamed you Miss K, with lips like sugar and hips like an unforgettable fire. Um, this next poem I wrote several years ago. It's about going to a softball game to watch my niece um, pitch. She, I think, was in middle school at the time, and she is now going to be a freshman in college, and she's still playing softball. So I thought I would read this one um, tonight. It's called Independence. The rain comes every day for weeks, sometimes in giant bursts, droplets breaking on tree branches. Often in drenching curtains, the wind blows west to east. The water pools muddied in the construction site outside my office. I'm quickly giving up on summer. You're saying you'll never let go. 
On the eve of 4th of July, it's dry. We drive over an hour to the middle of nowhere for a softball game. The tractor parked outside the Turbotville Great Value and marked spots for buggies. A young couple climbs into one. He's suspended and bearded. She's white capped and long dressed, unwrinkled. They look full of hope. I think there's a poem here. I try to take pictures, but my memory is full. You refrain from a lecture. My niece throws strike after strike after strike in the bottom of the sixth. The stands cheer. The next day we wake to more rain. Okay. And now um, this poem is now about my twin sister. This is the first poem um, she was in it. And um, I do write about my sister frequently too. And this is another found poem with um, words and phrases. Um, that came from the Minneapolis Skyway that connects the buildings in downtown Minneapolis. And then it kind of morphed into a poem about my sister. It's called Time Door. These twin cities don't look exactly the same, like you and your sister, her red hair to your brown. She speaks with her right hand, you always go left. Her scientific logic questions your emotional language. She seeks wide fields, corn stalks swaying. Her husband saves the hen house from foxes roaming the night. You want stacked vertical living, 1 a.m. conversations in a standing room only bar, sun rising over steel. Stop there. Choose your wings carefully and tell her to do the same. No need for separate, separate exits. You will fly together to the Mississippi River of your childhood, far south of here. Where you, where you splashed each other, ran away, then toward one another, knowing your parallel paths will somehow cross on this skyway, a labyrinth connecting the past to the present, a sanctuary for you both. You breathe in tandem like these cities, no matter how many miles are between you. You know, she knows, where one ends and the other begins, even as the sky fills with snow. Okay. This poem is called Meteor Shower. Temple Tuttle takes her time orbiting the sun, slow but fierce, leaves her signature, and when Earth crosses her path, an orchestrated show of light. Just before dawn, you lie on the concrete sidewalk five hours behind the East Coast, a symphony of birds singing the morning awake. You snap pictures of Jupiter, Venus, and Mars, the distance between immeasurable with just the eye. Then Leonid Radiant falls through the constellation Leo and the shower changes everything. I ask when you'll be home. You answer right quick. Just after midnight, I lie down on a cold driveway, dead leaves scratching its surface. Above me, pines and red oaks tiptoe their way to the northern sky. My Scorpio lives by the moon, has a hard time forgetting. Your Aries lives close to the edge of Mars. We will find each other for this every day. The comet lumbers along. The meteor shower comforts. Mother Earth spins. Right quick takes on new meaning in space. 33 years to orbit just once. We're experts at waiting. Okay. And this next one um, is a relatively new poem, and it's was kind of taken um, from a variety of free rights. So it's kind of um, cobbled together. It's called, I woke up at 3 a.m. thinking I was somewhere else. The air hasn't taken the turn toward fall quite yet. I want to be a tree blowing in wind. I want to be the last leaf to fall, bright orange. No, I want to be crimson. Clouds are moving against the jet screen. White gray sky carries hidden stories. Ma maybe if I had had a daughter, I would know the secrets of this land. Mom of grown sons, I often stand on the sidelines. How often can a heart skip a beat and still go on? Sometimes I can hear the ocean in the mountain wind. Maybe the air has turned. Maybe I can no longer feel variations. Remember Etch-a-Sketches? A quick shake would erase a life. I miss cardboard playhouses, Zoom, the TV show, and electric company, my mom's fried chicken, the greasy paper bag she used to bread it. I can see the leaves are dimming before their turn. 
The water tower is dismantled. I pray the ch church steeple doesn't topple. Thank you again for being here, um, to Diane for asking me, um, Shantae for the te tech help. This is my last poem. It's called Good Girls. Good girls learn the difference between second and third bases from older girls while listening to tapestry in the back bedroom of a chilly duplex, parents hush talk floating up through the floor vents. Good girls write Mrs. Hudak with fancy curly cues in the back of their mead binders, marry first loves. Good girls do not play spin the bottle, hearts racing in the back of a coat closet, don't even think about strip poker. Good girls don't do 7 a.m. walks of shame or hang on front porches with frat boys drinking and smoking, but go to confession on Saturday afternoons, receive communion on the tongue, not in palm of hand. Good girls sew Power Ranger Halloween costumes, bake from scratch, chaperone first grade field trips to the Baltimore Aquarium. Good girls don't accelerate through yellow lights, don't allow preteen sons to grow hair past shoulders or listen to Metallica. Good girls don't long for afternoons alone, apartments in the city, dream jobs on the West Coast, endless nights of dancing at concerts, the smell of men who aren't their husbands. Thank you so much. And now we're going to hear from Roger. Hi, everyone. I spent uh, a good part of my career working in the mining and oil and gas industry in, in uh, um, the Western US. And so my first couple of poems, doing environmental work, my first couple of poems are about that. They say, they say Highway 50 is the loneliest highway in America, running through the middle of Nevada from the high elevation of Great Basin National Park through the basin and range country, over mountain passes, through desert as far as the eye can see, to populated Carson City and South Lake Tahoe. But there are lonelier roads in central Nevada, some paved, many rough unpaved roads, cutting straight swaths through an endless sea of sagebrush, pinyon pine and juniper covered mountain passes, often a hundred miles or more between gas stations. They say central Nevada was once submerged, a shallow inland sea teeming with giant reptiles. Violent volcanic eruptions folded and lifted the land, building five parallel mountain ranges, the four valleys between becoming desiccated desert. They say Native Americans traveled along the creek beds into the hazy, smoky valley, leaving behind a treasure of ancient campsites and and the story of prehistoric survival in a harsh land. The angular Tuabi Range to the west, narrow canyons, aspen lined creeks, springs, green oasis, hard to reach wilderness areas at over 11,000 foot elevation. The rounded Takima Range to the east, volcanic calderas, perfect geochemical conditions to precipitate gold and silver. Miners came in the early 1900s hastily built boom towns, Manhattan, Belmont, Tonopah, Goldfield, fueled by dreams and greed, the easy gold quickly mined, leaving tailings piles, mine shafts, ghost towns, and the colorful strata of exposed mountainsides. They say central Nevada is the land of boom and bust, the third resurrection of the Round Mountain Mine, aided by new processing technologies, once gold nuggets stuck out of the ground, now a nine, 900 foot deep pit, a mile, long, a, mile and a, a mile long and half mile wide, thousands of tons of earth moved to recover ounces of microscopic gold. Cyanide heat bleach piles, hundreds of feet high that will drain toxic fluids for hundreds of years. The plan to clean up this mess, a concept only, an engineered plan pushed far off into the future. A new town sprouting in the middle of nowhere, mobile homes, grocery stores, pizza parlor, gas stations, schools, the ghost towns of Manhattan and Belmont reoccupied, surging and swooning in alignment with the price of gold. Tonopah, once the destination of an early 20th century gold rush, nearly died 
surged with the opening of a molybdenum mine that nearly died again when it closed. But ever hopeful geologists have new visions for the next mining boom, exploring for molybdenum, gold, and lithium. They say that central Nevada was the home to the sagebrush rebellion. The few ranches left still make a living grazing cattle on overgrazed public land almost devoid of edible forage, paying a pittance in grazing fees, a radical few not paying, fighting with the Bureau of Land Management since the 1990s over grazing fees and water rights. They say that central Nevada had legal brothels in saloons near mining towns or in a collection of trailers along highways with free parking and showers for long distance truckers. Many with colorful names only recently closed. Alien Cat House, The Den, Harem, Red Rooster, Janie's Ranch, Shady Lady, Angels, Angels Ladies. But every gas station, grocery store, and restaurant still has a few slot machines, a novelty enjoyed by tourists traveling to Las Vegas in Area 51. It takes a special breed to thrive in this land of extremes. Spectacular lightning shows, booming thunder, hailstorms, flash floods, howling winds, dust devils, frigid winters, but also spectacular high elevation wilderness and world-class stargazing in night skies unobscured by city lights. Plain speaking people, no pretense or perhaps the agenda well hidden, coming to terms or not with harsh reality and remoteness. And my next poem is called, The White Elephant Restaurant is Gone. I drive through a sea of pumping oil wells as far as the eye can see. To the district office, a double wide trailer, closer to life's realities where the real work is done. Once or twice a month, I visit with James and Leroy until it is time for lunch. Then we head to the White Elephant Restaurant, the social hub of Taft. Nothing in this place seemed to change except for the daily special. Just another coffee shop, fake leather booths, bar in the back with dance floor, country music, beer, good times. But when I sat in this place, I could feel the tension draining out of me. Everyone knew everyone's business. If you wanted to know about drilling results from the rig working on the next lease, you waited for the company man to leave, then swab the contractor for information. Leroy, then in his 60s, had worked in the oil field since his teens, always with another incredible fish story, sometimes about fishing, later forced to retire after an oil company merger. James called Taft Mayberry RFD. He would leave his keys in his pickup bed. I watched James' life unfold at the White Elephant, the breakup of his marriage, flirting with the waitress who he later married, taking pride in ownership and running his leases. He became another cog in the wheel after the merger. White Elephant days were good times when crazy wildcatters ran the small oil companies. Employees were treated like family, a time of handshake deals before the lawyers and 100-page contracts, before the big fish swallowed up the little fish. Years later, I returned to Taft, rummaging through the pieces of my past, searching for what I thought I had lost, I look for the place along Central Avenue, but the White Elephant Restaurant is gone. Fortunately, the people are still around. A sweet day of reminiscing, for some the good old days recalled, for others a new life with better days ahead and a past not lost. The next couple of poems are about uh, the times Diane and I spent in Tehachapi, California. Lazy Weekend. It used to be so important to stuff as much as possible into a weekend after sitting in an office all week. Full calendar, endless meetings, idiot bosses, unproductive nonsense. Now a lazy weekend is perfectly fine. Leisurely breakfast, watching our million dollar view, birds at the feeder, walking the dogs, bopping around town, watching a movie, reading, afternoon lovemaking, napping, love spending time with you. My four month sabbatical has been mostly wonderful, sometimes frustrating and disappointing, thinking about what is really important, finding out who are my real friends 
a balanced life filled with community, poetry, live music, photography, travel, perhaps learning to play a musical instrument. To suffer the hassles of relocation or stay put at any cost, the uncertainty, the waiting, none of this entirely within my control, learning to go with the flow, but all this angst and overthinking can wait until Monday because today I am having a lazy day. And my next poem is called Crack of Dawn. 5.15 alarm clock sounds, out of bed, feet hit the ground. Dogs waiting to go downstairs, however they are unaware that this is a fire drill day, up and at them, I can't play. Short-term work, consulting gig, paying job, that I can dig. Wolf down breakfast, out the door, down the highway, engine roars. 7.30 meeting in Palmdale, must be on time without fail. My former life crack of dawn, no time to linger or to yawn. At meeting after meeting, body and soul taking a beating. Thinking all this stress was fine, exhausted, went to bed at nine. My, my new life, no more early rise, plenty of time to focus eyes. This single early startup day reminds me of my earlier ways. I have become very aware early mornings are hard to bear. Uh, next couple of poems are about places that um, Diane and I have visited. Um, the first is called Grand Canyon Views. Grand Canyon splendor, early May, a cold, blustery, foggy day. On and off snow, onward we drive, tourists in building like bees in their hive. Thick fog obscures Grand Canyon views, drove all this way, now have the blues. At last fog lifts, sun sh sunlight shines through, we finally get amazing views. Tourists swarm to take their pics, cell phones mounted on selfie sticks. Visual proof that they were there, crowds thicker than I can bear. I prefer quiet and reverie, alone in nature let me be. I take photos, but I really, I really find the beauty captured in my mind. And this next poem was called Leaving Las Vegas. Into desert from afar, airport to hotel by car, an oasis in the sand, no connection to the land, bright colors, odd shapes in a line, being over the top is fine, carnival atmosphere abounds, see and be seen making the rounds. <clears throat> Safely inside fancy cocoon, painted ceilings with stars and moon, Water down drinks, sip nonstop, girls start dancing on tabletop. Thousands walking down the street, bumping into all they meet. Everywhere, glamour and glitz. People hand out cards with tits. Women clad in scanty dress with their barely covered breasts. Old folks while away the day, hours spent on slot game play. Finally time to leave the strip on the next leg of our trip. Ready to leave Vegas behind to recapture peace of mind. This is a, uh, a poem about uh, um, the wedding Diane and I planned about uh, 12, 13 years ago called Perfect Day. Today we implement the plan, internet research in hand. Off we go, Hollywood bound, store to store making the rounds. Navigating city streets, you're energized by urban beat. Rainbow colors in full bloom, but for me, too little room. In hot pursuit of vintage dress, of what type, I can only guess. What you really have in mind as we search racks for a find. After grabbing bite to eat, walking down a busy street, see a store once rejected, decide it's time to reinspect it. Discover clothes for wedding day in our unconventional way deviating from the plan basically because we can. Find a quiet place to eat, sit a spell to rest our feet. Time reflecting on the day, waiting planned in our own way. It was then I realized that the unexpected prize doesn't depend on what we do, but rather spending time with you. And this next poem is a... Uh, um, a haiku in three stanzas called Winter's Chill. Lazy crescent moon, 
hovering over highway, wind whooshes, wind chimes. Moonless end of night, stars shine, clouds hang on hillsides. Frosty air chills face. Fog obscures darkness, chilly blanket of dampness, crunch of ice on road. And my last poem is uh, um, about my grandfather's uh, toward, uh, grand, grandfather towards the end of his life. Grandpa Saturdays. He is dressed in blue blazer, frayed dress shirt, stained gray slacks, bad haircut, stubby beard, vacant look. The monotony of the facility, the loss of independence, scheduled showers three days a week. Still able to walk, he comes and goes, sneaking in brown paper bags. Alcohol, his only friend for dulling depression's pain. Fifteen years before he was full of life, he used to walk so fast I could hardly keep up, rolled a mean backhand at the bowling alley. The two of us went for lunch every Saturday. I had a barbecue beef sandwich and lemon meringue pie, still a favorite. He had coffee and pie. Sweet memories of weekly visits, root beer floats made with secret ingredients, cards dealt from the bottom of the deck so I could win, thinking I didn't know. But I knew, I knew. Now rarely able to visit, hear the slur in his voice when I call. I think he knows who I am, but I'm not sure. I want to be there for him, repay him for his love at a time when unconditional love was scarce and put down plentiful. I inherited a picture of him at my parents' wedding, of him when he was at my parents' wedding. Never saw him when he was this young a vibrant man in his 50s, the memory I choose to savor. And next is uh, David Nixon. Okay, I'm here in Hilton, New York, and I'm going to read some poems from my most recent book, Stephen Forgives the Stones, New and Selected Poems, which oddly is also from Foothills Publishing. And I'm going to read some other things as well. We'll start with poems from the book. The first poem is called Hunting the World. When the world weaves slowly over the hills, we all lie waiting in the bushes. At the prearranged signal, we all jump out and cover the world with arms, legs, torsos, tumble the drunken globe to the ground and tear its limbs off, eat its heart out. Swarming over the shattered carcass, we gnaw and gnaw, but none grows full. Okay, the next two poems from the book are about Dick and Jane. I learned to read with Dick and Jane, or at least that's what they were teaching in first grade back then. And the first is called See Puff Drive the Dragon. Look, Jane, see Spot bleed. See Spot eaten by the dragon. See Puff drive the dragon off as Dick pukes in the green bushes. Look, Jane, see the dragon run. See Puff slash the dragon open. Look, Dick, see Spot stagger out of the dragon's torn guts. See Puff lick Spot clean. Look, look, see the dead dragon. Feel us all back together, happy, alive. See what Puff has done. Okay. Well, my sister uh, taught reading to young kids as a school teacher, and she likes Dick and Jane a lot. So she didn't like that too much. And she said, where was Sally? I had forgotten Sally. So here's a poem called Sally Alone. Sally is left behind to grow alone in dust and mud, while Dick and Jane go off to college in another state. 
Spot and Puff die of old age, as do Mom and Dad. Sally sells dandelion wine and makes dresses from sheets. She crashes with friends and strangers, writes beat poems in rain and heat, has ponchos made of blankets. One light, one heavy, cover the seasons. Sally sings on the street, recites poems for coins in her flowered flop hat. Some nights she dreams her pale family, but mostly Sally leaves them behind, creates her own Eden with no forbidden trees. All right, the next one is called A Hard Journey. Let's see, let me find it. All right, A Hard Journey. Every day I want to smack someone to make a cutting comment, to swear at some jerk or just someone who innocently annoys me. Every day I must struggle to stay my hand, my tongue, to keep what peace I can so that the small wars of the present do not flare up and threaten to rage into deadly conflagrations. You have to fight fire with hard-won caution so that you may not need the holy water of protest and nonviolent intervention. So you may save that liquid bomb to pour on fires others are bound to set. Even if I were Smokey the Bear, peace would be a hard journey, always alert to hold back my own folly, always so many fires to try to put out. All right. Next one is called Blue Beaver Dream. In my dream, the blue beavers slapped their heavy flat tails on green water and ripple spread beyond the dam's dark logs throughout the fathomless pond. Purple bird trills hung above the green ripples and shimmered in the crimson air. I willed myself to stay asleep and dove beneath the pond's surface where blue beavers led me into the clear, dark rooms of their log dam house, and I felt my blue tail blossom with such power that I might swim forever in this dwelling made by parents' tails and teeth. All right. <clears throat> The next one is called, How You Lost Your Inner Light. A light swung on the night waves, saving the sailors from the reef. You had an emerald in the pocket of your red silk blouse. A blue and green scarf flowed around your neck. No one felt the emerald's presence as you danced outside the lighthouse door until dawn rode in on a dark, Crow wind. Then the murder sent down one swift thief who plucked the jewel from your breast. Okay, we're going to go from the book to uh, four tiny poems that are in a manuscript of tiny poems of three lines or less uh, called Remembering Barbara that I'm, I'm working on getting typed up and sent out to someone. All right, so the first is an untitled three-line poem. Hunger is coming, rattling its loose teeth like black castanets. Listen. All right, the second of these is a two-line poem, and its title is Oneness. Every living thing breathes in me and dies. All right, the third is an untitled two-line poem. Tonight we carry our dreams, clear water. The buckets are full. We watch our stuff. 
Yeah. All right, the last of these tiny poems that I'm going to read is a two-line poem, and its title is, While We Live, It Is Never Holy Winter. Deep in the mind, a mindless yellow flower with a black eye at its center blooms forever. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to go to a couple of uh, newer poems that aren't in the book or the manuscript. And the first of these is a short poem called Memory Loss. See how the light begins to fade. As it grows dim, perhaps new light will rise within you, making you see only as a little child, painfully born again, ready to enter paradise. All right, here's a, a short poem called Dark Vision. The day has cooled into night. No fireworks disturb the dark. Electric sounds are not too harsh. Now is the time for quiet verse to open the back door of the hearse. Behold the body stripped of light. All right, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go back to the book for a moment. And the next poem in the book is a poem related to the troubles of my wife uh, when she was sick and eventually died. And so this poem is called Imperfect Life. Imperfect life. I hate to go to the hospital where medics and machines colonize a life. When morning tries to bugle me awake, I come along slowly, perhaps fall in line by mid-afternoon. Once the bed calls me back, I ignore those notes and stay up watching basketball, scratching scraps of tiny poems. Medicine threatens to regiment me, to twist my flesh beyond recognition. Seeing Barbara's zombie stare, or later, the fear in her eyes as she lies unspeaking in the cell of her hospital bed, is one more reason to bang my head on the wall. All right, let's see. Looks like I might have somewhere near a couple more minutes to go or so. Let's see. I'll do something more from the book then, I guess. All right, here is a poem called How Even Death. Mumble all you will or rave, but you shall never know my love or why she holds me in the afternoon. The way the shadows of her eyes explain the inexplicable, or how even death holds its breath a moment in her presence. All right, let's see. Maybe a couple more quick ones here. All right. Uh, Here's one called Tithing, Tithing to Eros. Look, the glasses fuse in beauty. Create a huge crystal pitcher, fall away to single glasses. The deer runs through the dense forest without breaking a single tree. The red fox rises from the grove and trots in the blazing air. I tithe to arrows with my poems. Lately, I bow beyond tithing, so my secular poetry goes broke. Even now, ragged political poems are gathering in my cortex, planning the parade route, filling canteens at a sparse spring. Uh, 14. OK. 
Okay, one more short one. Um, this one is going to be called Lost Meeting. On the other hand, no, it's not going to be called Lost Meeting. It's going to be called Our Long Journey. We'll do that one. As I raved deep into the night, she silenced me with a long kiss, which never could betray. Then she led me through blue stars into an azure day that stretched beyond us. Years later, she walked off alone beyond all time, and I was left as day faded to twilight. Now I start to follow her path, which winds beyond the earth's warped ways. Okay, thank you, everyone. And uh, now, Diane, to end things up. Thank you. Thank you. It was a wonderful reading tonight. Um, my thanks again to Don and to David. And my special thanks to my husband, Roger, for stepping in uh, when Adrian had an emergency and couldn't be here with us tonight. Um, again, I'd like to thank Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture and just just saying a blessing for all that we have in art and culture and the miracle of Zoom to bring us all together from different areas of the country. Um, thank you again to my guests. And next month in August, we will be hearing from Cathabella Wilson, Christopher T. George, and Michael Hickey. And uh, Again, thank you, everyone, and see you next month in hot August. Good night.